Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm very happy to welcome you uh, this evening to the Baker Institute. Uh, <clears throat> we have a, a noted speaker tonight, uh, the permanent representative of Iraq to the United Nations, His Excellency Ambassador Hamid al-Bayati. Uh, you have his biography uh, in the program notes. Uh, you see that he was appointed permanent representative of Iraq to the UN in 2006. Uh, he worked as Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs, Political Affairs, and Bilateral Relations from 2004 to 2006. And during the same period, he headed the Iraq Center for Strategic Studies uh, in Iraq. Uh, what is, he, he Dr. Al-Bayadi in our short meeting uh, just now reminded me that he was part of the Iraqi opposition group uh, that uh, I met with when I was Assistant Secretary of State for the Middle East in those uh, early years, in 1993, 91-93. Um, he participated in Iraq's opposition conference in Beirut in 91, and the Salah Adin conference in 92, and he became a member of the Executive Council of the Iraqi National Congress, the uh, INC, it was known as. Um, and when he also came to Washington as part of the uh, Iraqi opposition delegation in August 2002 to meet with the top administration officials. Uh, his work and uh, experience in the Iraqi opposition movement is, is a very important one. And uh, he also worked on the supervising committee that overlooked the work, the work of Indict, an organization that gathered documents and evidence of crimes committed by Saddam Hussein against the people of Iraq. What is not in your program notes, and uh, I hope the ambassador doesn't mind me t talking about this, but he was put in jail and he was tortured by the uh, infamous Mukhabarat, the general security director at, at the military intelligence department of Iraq. He was coerced to flee Iraq when Saddam's regime tried to rearrest and execute him. And he lost members of his family to Saddam Hussein's uh, gangs of uh, brutality. Uh, he's well published. You see where he's gotten his education. And he informed me that he's writing a book that we look forward to uh, reading about his experiences. So please uh, join me in welcoming uh, Ambassador uh, Al-Bayati, who will talk to us to, on transition to a democratic Iraq, a status report. And Thank you very much, um, Ambassador Jijian, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, good afternoon. It's a great pleasure to be among you to talk about Iraq and Iraqi experience. Um, I always feel um, glad to meet uh, people and to talk to them because um, I believe that American people are entitled to know the truth about what's happening in Iraq from Iraqi perspective because you always listen to the media and the media, unfortunately, doesn't give a balanced picture. They always focus on the negative side of the picture. As Iraqis, we realize that, that there are some problems, challenges, difficulties. However, there are uh, so many good sides of the picture with, which never been re reflected in the media. And um, one of the examples last um, 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 evening, um, it was announced that Barack Obama was elected as uh, the President of the United States. And this is the first African-American president who ever been elected. And I think, uh, as uh, U.S. Today put it, he shattered the racial uh, barrier which uh, was seemed unbreakable. This is uh, the new America. This is the real democracy. And many of my friends keep telling me, if Barack Obama was going to be elected, then this is real democracy in this country. Because a lot of people thought that the white people in America wouldn't tolerate a black president. But this reminds me of what's happening in Iraq. For the first time in the contemporary history, we have a Kurdish leader, a Kurdish president. The Kurdish citizens for the last 50 years, where they were considered second, if not third class citizens, and they were oppressed. Uh, uh, so much so that Saddam regime used chemical, biological weapons. He tried to wipe them out, basically. So um, I can feel that the similarity between our two countries and our two great nations. And um, 
I used to visit um, United States when I was based in London between 92 and 2003. As Ambassador Jajan mentioned, I met uh, a lot of officials in the State Department, uh, the Pentagon, the White House, Security, National Security Council, and, and other officials. And um, in all those years, um, I felt that there are similarities between um, the Iraqi people and the United States, uh, the American people. Um, I believe that the American is a, a nation of faith, and we are a nation of faith. And I think um, most of the um, waves of immigration come from Europe because of repression. And we oppose Saddam regime because of repression. It was political repression, uh, religious repression, and all kind of repression we, we um, faced during Saddam regime. Um, Saddam um, was a dictatorial um, um, man who couldn't tolerate any voice um, raised against him, including from members of his family. Saddam killed one of his cousins and his brother-in-law. Then he uh, killed two of his sons-in-law. And um, he killed almost uh, um, millions of Iraqis during the wars uh, against neighboring countries, the invasion of Kuwait. And between 1980 and 2003, Iraq was in continuous war, um, one kind of another. Therefore, uh, getting rid of Saddam regime was a dream, uh, a long uh, dream for the Iraqi people, and having democracy, human rights, um, and the rule of law um, was the big dream which came true. Um, I have to mention uh, several things in Iraq. I mean, with democracy, um, now we have a national unity government, a government which includes the Kurds, the Arab, the Turkomans, even the Christian community is represented. We have, a, for example, um, women minister, human rights minister, Wijdan Mikhail, she's from the Christian community. And when I asked her in New York uh, about human rights situation in Iraq, she said she enjoys the support of the prime minister although she criticized him from time to time. And I said, well, this is real democracy in Iraq. And she told me that she has the authority of the prime minister to go to any prison or detention center at any time to report about human rights situation. And um, this is what I like in Iraq. For the first time in the contemporary history, we had ex-president Shia Ghazi Liawar, two ex-prime ministers, Dr. Ad Allah and Dr. Ibrahim al-Ja'fari, while in the past we used to have executed president and executed prime ministers. So this is the beauty of democracy that we have presidents stepping down, other presidents coming up according to the will of the Iraqi people. Uh, I voted for the first time in my life in 2005. And you must have seen Iraqis in the TV jubilant and celebrating with their um, um, ink stained fingers in front of the media that they managed to vote, they managed to have a say, in the political life for the first time. Women rights, women were prevented from serving in any diplomatic mission outside Iraq. And the first lady who arrived in New York, she's my deputy now, I'm proud of her because really she's the best diplomat I have. And she's like doing the work of three, four diplomats, if not more, because she's a hardworking person, she's very competent, and I can depend on her 100%. Uh, and basically, Saddam couldn't send women to diplomatic missions because the majority of diplomats, they were from the intelligence, and all their missions is to kill people, to follow the opposition. And after the fall of Saddam regime, we discovered caches of weapons in each embassy, including the one in New York. Kalashnikovs, explosive, silencers, all over the world, because basically there was no diplomats, they were only um, intelligence who were, um, who whose mission was just to, to kill people. And being in Houston, Texas, I have to tell you this story. Just a few days ago, um, a real scholar, a Shiite real scholar, who is in Houston, died in Iraq in a car accident. But back in, in, in the 90s, he was in Thailand. And Saddam sent a, 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 an assassin to kill him while he was leading the prayer in his mosque. And while he was going to ground you know, for Sujud, the assassin shot him in the head once. And when he tried to shoot him again, there was a jam in the gun and he ran away. Now this guy survived the shot which uh, went through his head and uh, miraculously he, he survived, but he died in a car accident just a few days ago. Tomorrow we're going to um, 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 a morning um, 
uh, uh, ritual for him in the most local mosque in Houston. But this is one example of what diplomatic missions used to do outside Iraq, killing opposition, following people. And, um, you know, Thailand is far away from Iraq. I don't think s such a scholar will do a lot. He's not fighting the regime with weapons. Probably he was just um, criticizing the regime uh, from time to time. So um, after long repression of Saddam regime, over 30 years of uh, a brutal uh, uh, regime, we managed to have a freedom. We, ha we managed to have human rights. Uh, we, we managed to have rule of law for the first time. And I think the American uh, help us uh, to do that, to achieve that. And the democracy is spreading in the regions, not only in Iraq, but really many, many countries now is feeling that why well, we can't have what Iraqis have. And they start to feel that they should have democracy, they should have elections. Um, of course, um, after the fall of the regime, tourists come from all over the world, you know, Al-Qaeda and other terrorist groups, um, basically uh, because they found it the best place to fight the Americans and the Iraqi government, which was stamped as it's, they are, you know, American puppets or pro-Americans. But they, they, they start to attack civilians, women, children, uh, car bombs were everywhere, and they were killing people. And from our experience with these people, I wrote um, uh, many books. I published two books about terrorism, one about uh, Osama bin Laden, Al-Qaeda, and 9-11, and the second one about terrorist groups in Iraq. And I found that these people um, actually um, trying to kill as many people as possible to inflict as much the damage as possible. Um, now, many people will say, why we should go to war in Iraq? Why would, did we go to Afghanistan? Uh, we shouldn't send our sons and daughters to these countries. We shouldn't sacrifice all these lives. But I believe that the Americans were so patient when Al-Qaeda attacked in Saudi Arabia, in Al-Riyadh, and then in Al-Khobar. Then they were patient again when Al-Qaeda attacked in Yemen, as as call, when 17 sailors were killed. Then they attacked in Kenya, Tanzania. And then um, in 9-11, they attacked Americans in their homeland. And I don't think the American could stay still or the American government could do nothing about it. We couldn't wait for another tragedy or another disaster to take a place which could be similar or even worse than 9-11. Therefore, uh, the military doctrine has changed from what we used to call deterrence and containment policy to preemptive strike and war against terrorism. And this is why the Taliban regime was taking out, because they refused to hand over Osama bin Laden, who claimed responsibility um, for 9-11. And then Saddam regime, who was harboring terrorist groups, such as uh, Mujahideen Khalq, PKK, Abu Nidal, the Palestinian group, and many other terrorist groups. And as a result of the worries that Saddam might uh, threat Kuwait again, and, and he did it again and again after the liberation of Kuwait, he, deployed his troops in 1994, and when his son-in-law, Hussein Kamal, defected to Jordan in August 95, he confessed that Saddam deployed his troops with the intention of reinvading Kuwait. So we couldn't really tolerate a rogue regime like Saddam threatening the Gulf and the oil resources again and again, and every time you have to send troops. And I have a good proof that the United States didn't take Saddam regime out in 1991, because they had the authority they have the mandate from the Security Council to liberate Kuwait, but not to remove the regime. But what happened later, that Saddam continued to violate human rights, Saddam continued to use weapons against his people, Saddam continued to challenge the international community and UN resolution. And as a result, I think um, the best solution was to get rid of Saddam regime. We feel that Iraq, the region, and the whole world is safer without Saddam regime. Now, the terrorists um, managed to get a safe haven in Afghanistan, and we see all these attacks, including 9-11. And they tried to get some safe, haven, some safe havens in Iraq. So if they managed to get Iraq or part of Iraq as a safe haven, God knows what we could have seen. Therefore, I think we are now partners. Iraq and the United States are partners. They are allies in the war against international terrorism. Now we are in the process of rebuilding Iraq reconstruction. Iraq is very rich with its natural and human resources. We have oil, gas, minerals, water, 
um, almost every every uh, uh, human and natural resource um, to rebuild Iraq. Oil and gas, and I know Houston is a center for oil companies. It's the huge potential for businesses in Iraq. Um, I think uh, we have 115 uh, um, billion barrel of oil as a reserve, which puts Iraq in the second or the third place of the largest reserve of oil. We have um, gas reserves, and I think there's huge opportunities for oil companies and gas companies to come and invest in Iraq. Um, we look forward to improve um, the infrastructure. We need to rebuild almost everything after over three decades of negligence and um, wars and destruction. So um, I believe now, after the improvement of security, we are on a stage that we could look forward to rebuild the country. A year ago, more than a year ago, everybody was hearing that Iraq on the verge of a civil war or sectarian conflict, especially after the Al-Qaeda attack against the Holy Shrine of Shiite in Samarra, which of course provoked some, some Shiite and there was some reaction and counter attacks. However, now the situation is much better, security is much, uh, much better, and we are focusing on reconstruction, rebuilding the country, and I think with the help of uh, friendly nations, uh, such as the American and other nations, we will be able to rebuild Iraq, and hopefully we'll see that Iraq uh, stand up on its feet again and uh, could be a stable, secure, and prosperous country. And um, of course, I have to mention um, the uh, status of forces agreement. We are in the process of signing such kind of agreement between United States and uh, Iraq about um, the forces in Iraq. Um, these forces, they were in Iraq since 2003. Every year we had a resolution by the Security Council to renew the mandate for one year. But last year the Iraqi government decided that will be the last year this year. And by the end of the year this mandate will expire and it has to be replaced by um, a bilateral agreement called Status of Forces Agreement, or the SOFA. And there's another agreement, what we call Framework Strategic Agreement, which is going to be uh, regulating all kinds of political, diplomatic, economic, um, cultural, and all other relationships. And um, I think we are going to have a long strategic relationship between Iraq and the United States. I think I should stop here because um, I, I tried to cover um, the general picture about the situation in Iraq. I'm sure you will have some comments, some questions, and uh, I, I will be ready to answer them. So I will leave it to you. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, please uh, just raise your hands. We'll recognize you and just identify yourself and ask your question to the ambassador. Yes, I'm Nancy Dunlap. How would you characterize the Iraqi government's ability to move forward in democracy, the government that's there and with the upcoming elections, since all we hear is what we get from the media? Uh, we have the general elections and you have the local elections. Now, the general election is going to be next year in November. However, we're going to have in January, before the end of January next year, the local elections. These are provincial elections. Um, there was the law which was passed by the parliament about these elections, and recently there were some amendments about the minorities in, in these elections. So we hope that the local elections will, will uh, go forward smoothly according to the timetable. And again, the next general election, we're going to have a uh, an election for the president, the prime minister, and for the government. So we, we are on the right track. We're still uh, living in a transitional period. We have some difficulties, but we are trying to build an Iraq for the future generation. We don't want future generation to suffer as much as we suffered my generation and so many generations. I think three, four generations suffered from the Ba'ath regime, which came to power in 1968, over 40 years now. Um, Iraq was really um, always in the negative um, you know, situation, and we suffered a lot. We sacrificed a lot of lives, a lot of wealth from Iraqi oil revenues. So um, we are building democracy, we are building freedom, and human rights and the rule of law for the future generations. Hi, my name is Christian. Um, so as you might know, a majority of Americans oppose the war in Iraq, but 
you know, as we don't have democracy, it doesn't really matter what the people want. But uh, my question is, uh, Obama earlier seemed like he was saying that he wanted to bring the troops home, right? And it seemed that his position has changed a little bit. I don't remember exactly what he said, but he seems to be saying now that troops will stay. And I mean, what do you think with this change of administration, uh, we'll see as far as, can we expect a drawdown entirely of American troops? Because most American people want the troops home completely. Um, well, I think um, we've heard assurances from President Obama, President-elect Obama, that he will listen to the views of the experts on the field. Uh, and th that means political experts, military experts, and even Iraqi experts. We as Iraqis, we feel that we still need those troops to stay in Iraq uh, until we have a strong army to defend the country, until we have a strong police force who could maintain security in Iraq. And then, of course, um, we love uh, these forces to go back home safely. Um, situation is much better now. Um, Last week I was in South Dakota and I participated in the ceremony of welcoming back some troops. They came completely safe without any loss, which is good news. And before that I was in Middleton camp and the general there in the Marine base, he told me that in the last few months we never been to any of these ceremonies of, of uh, American soldiers killed in Iraq. So um, our worry was about lives, losing lives in Iraq, as long as the situation is good and secure as long as these soldiers are safe in Iraq, that's the important issue. Now, the issue of withdrawing them, if they are withdrawn prematurely, we might, have, uh, we might have a setback in Iraq, and a setback in security will affect not only Iraqis, but it could affect the Americans as well. So it's the equation that um, the stronger army we have, the more capable we are to maintain security. Of course, we less, we'll depend less on foreign forces. Uh, Bob Stobal. Uh, I was wondering about the relationship uh, between the uh, Shias and the Sunnis and the Kurds in the Iraqi government and also the uh, relationship between any of that group and uh, the Iranian government. Um, well, before I talk about the relation between Sunnis and Shiites and Kurds in the government, let me tell you that the Iraqi society is a, a unique mosaic of different ethnic, sectarian, and religious groups. However, all these groups lived in peace and harmony over hundreds of years. Uh, so there is no such problem really between the components, different components of the Iraqi people. And I'm a person who was born and lived in Iraq, and I can tell you stories, but I don't want to have time. I'm from a Muslim family, but my father put me in a Christian school when I was young. It was a good private school. And beside the school, there was a church. I used to go to the church. And I used to go back to my uh, family telling them stories about the church because as a child, I was fascinated by you know, high ceilings, high building, the statue of Jesus and Mary and the stories, that stories. They never said, you are a Muslim, you shouldn't go to the church. You know? And then when I was a young boy, I, I remember my father, he was in business. He was from middle class business family and he was doing business. A guy came to his office when he left, he said, son, he's a Jew, and when you walk with, when you do business with Jews, they are straightforward people. I don't believe all the Jews are straightforward people, but listening to my father putting me in a Christian school as a Muslim, I felt when I grown up uh, that my father doesn't distinguish between Muslim, Christian, or, or a Jew. So uh, we lived like that, you know, this is the real life, this is the real Iraq I lived in, and I, I can testify that this is the real Iraq. Um, and what Saddam did, the problem Saddam play on a uh, sectarian card at a time, on the nationalist card, on the religious card. You know, he fought the Kurds, and the Kurds are Sunnis, by the way. But he can't say they are not Sunnis, because they are Sunnis. So he said they are Kurds, they are non-Arab. And he played on the nationalist card. When he fought the Shia, and when he fought Iran, he's a Sunni Muslim to have the support of the Sunni world. But when he fought the Christian, he's a Muslim hero against the crusade. So this is a policy of divide and conquer or divide and rule. Um, so going back to your question, the relation is really very good. And I work with the Kurds, with the Sunnis, with the Shiites, with the Christian in the, during the opposition time for a long time. And I work with all the officials. The relation is really good. The only thing we should realize that this is a democracy. This is not one man rule. 
either we have to choose between Saddam regime, which was a one-man rule, and then he will decide everything, he will issue any law in the country, and nobody could say anything in between a democracy where you have different kind of views, where you differ, where you, you know. But relation is good, I can assure you, between the Kurds, the Sunnis, and Shiites, and the government, even the people. The people are more important than the government. Because when Al-Qaeda tried to bring a sectarian war among the Sunnis and the Shiites, the people refused. Both the Sunnis and Shiites refused that. So I, I don't rule out that we have some problems, some individuals, some small groups, but I'm talking about the vast majority of the Iraqi people. Now, in relation with Iran, uh, we as Iraqis, we believe that we should live in peace with all neighboring countries. We fed up with wars against neighbors, and Saddam had a war against Iran. He had a war against Kuwait. And then from time to time, I had some problems with Jordan, with Turkey, with Kuwait, with Syria, with almost all neighbors. Now, um, we have a different view with the US uh, administration that we have to live in, in peace and harmony with our neighbors. We try to put the pressure on them from time to time not to interfere into our internal affairs. The only problem, we had vacuum power vacuum, military vacuum, security vacuum, and not only Iran, but many neighbors try to start to interfere into our internal affairs. Once we are strong and we have a strong army and police force and security organization, we can stop these countries from interfering into our internal affairs. Gentlemen, the that's far the, the you relationship the, I'm sorry? Identify yourself. Oh, I'm sorry. My name is David Gebman. I'm, I'm a grad student here at Rice. Yeah, so far the relationship between the American occupation and the individuals that we in this country serve know collectively as the insurgency <laughs> has been a primarily hostile military conflict. Uh, but as of late, it seems that that is, is, is diffusing. And so I'm wondering, your perspective on the relationship between the forces, American forces in Iraq and the insurgency, is there a change of, of tactic? Is there a change in that relationship? Is there more communication or negotiations going on? Or is it simply a, a, a kind of victory or kind of loss? I mean, how would you describe that relationship? OK. Um, US Army, they have, um, when they had occupation, they start to have resistance or insurgency. They call themselves resistance. We call them insurgency. Basically, they are different kinds of groups. Al Qaeda. There's no way that you can reconcile with these people because they don't believe in democracy. In actual fact, during the election, they threat that whoever go to the ballot boxes could be killed and have some car bombs, suicide bombers during the elections. So we can't have reconciliation with Al-Qaeda, especially those foreigners who come from different countries that want to fight um, the Iraqis and the Americans in Iraq. The rest of the groups, either Saddam's loyalists, some of these groups are part of Saddam network who went underground after the fall of the regime, or some people who believe that they should fight foreign forces because this is occupation. Now, recently, there was some kind of um, improvement between, uh, improvement of relation between the United States and some of these insurgency who, who became part of what we call awakening councils, or Sons of Iraq in Ambar, which was the hub of uh, the terrorist. Um, the American tried to attract Iraqis and try to separate them from Al-Qaeda, because Al-Qaeda was depending on this insurgency for shelter, support, weapons, and other things. So now um, these people start to fight Al-Qaeda. Al-Qaeda was um, um, very much um, um, weak in, in Iraq in, in recent months. Uh, so I can say the relation now is good. However, these people want the Iraqi government to take care of them now, to observe them, and the Iraqi government decided to observe 20% of them in the military forces, and they will look into observing the rest in civilian jobs. But they have to check their record, because some of them, they were involved in violence, then it would be difficult. But we are in the process of taking them in, because we don't want them to go um, and work with the insurgency or with Al-Qaeda. Let me make a comment on what the ambassador said. We had the leaders of Anbar province come to the Baker Institute several months ago, and one of the points they made uh, in response to some of the questions we're getting from the audience is that uh, I asked them, uh, what do you think the status of American troops should be in Iraq? And they said, we want the American troops to leave, but do not leave precipitously without two things happening. One, 
as you said, Mr. Ambassador, that the Iraqi armed forces should be reformed so that they are a multi-confessional force, so that when the American troops leave, the Iraqi armed forces and police are not a sectarian force, because the, as soon as we leave, there'll be problems, serious problems, step backward. And the second one was that do not divide our country along sectarian grounds. Do it along geographic grounds uh, on the basis of the 18 provinces and geographically. And I think that's an important statement coming from the Iraqis. Uh, yes, my name is R.T. Castleberry. Um, the Iraqi government is sitting on billions and billions of dollars of um, reconstruction uh, dollars. If, as you say, Sunni, Shiite, and Kurd are not in conflict, why haven't y'all moved farther into reconstruction? Why, haven't, why aren't y'all farther into it? Um. Yeah, we have surplus of um, um, billions of dollars because of the high prices of oil in the last year. I mean, it wasn't planned in the budget. We have an initial budget, and then we have um, additional budget, which uh, was designed to absorb this or to, to use this surplus money. Um, why we couldn't use them? First of all, um, a year ago, up to two years ago, the security situation wasn't allowing us to do any construction. I'll give you one example. Whenever the Iraqi government announced that they resume exporting oil through the pipeline to Turkey, it was blown up the next day by the insurgents. This is one thing. They attack power plants. They attack water facilities. So whatever you start to reconstruct, they will um, attack. The, because, as I said, the loyalists to the regime, they know how to, to hurt the government and the people by attacking the economic uh, you know, facilities and the infrastructure. Now. Um, this surplus, and th of course, has been um, um, with democracy, with the new situation, every budget should be approved uh, by what they call economic committee, and then it will go to the cabinet to be approved by the ministers, and then it will go to the parliament to be approved, every budget. And by the way, between 79 and 2003, when Saddam became president, he never announced any budget. Nobody knew how much he get from the oil revenue, how much he spent on what. So now, since 2003, every year we announce the budget, the budget is approved by the parliament. This is the difference. So by the time we went to the parliament to approve the surplus of the budget, uh, part of it was allocated to the education, part of it was allocated to the health sector, and of course, part of it was allocated to the reconstruction. We are in a process now with the improvement of security to spend all this money uh, for reconstruction. Well, when it's part of it in the budget of 2008, part of it is going to be part in the budget of 2009. So we are in the process of um, spending those money. As I said in the past, some money allocated to reconstruction, but they were not used because of the security problem. Yes. Hi, I'm just signing my student here. Um, I have two questions. The first one is, uh, who was involved in the initial creation of the government, of the new government? How much Iraqi involvement was there? And then the second question, as the representative to the UN, um, have you proposed any plans or are you working um, with new policies to address the Iraqi refugee situation? Well, who is involved in, in the Iraqi, um, among the Iraqis? You know, the, the Iraqis, first of all, um, they have the first election in January 2005. They elected a general assembly which was in charge of drafting a permanent constitution. And this is the first time you have a permanent constitution since 1958, since the toppling of the monarchy. Then we had a referendum in October to approve, general referendum by people to approve that constitution. And then we have another election in December 2005 to elect a government according to that constitution. So you can see the process. It's a very short process comparing how long the constitution took um, time in the United States, for example, and any other democracy in the world. So in one year time, we managed to have permanent constitution approved by the people, another election to elect the government. And by the way, um, between 70 to 75 percent of the Iraqi people participate in those two elections and the, the referendum. So the government, as a result of the elections, now is a government, the first elected government uh, ever in the contemporary history of Iran. The second question about the UN, if I um, understand you correctly, um, let me talk here a little bit about Iraq and the UN. 
Um, Iraq was isolated in the UN for a long time, for over 30 years, because of Saddam Wars and the invasion of Kuwait and the sanctions. Uh, however, a new Iraq after 2003 has a different uh, situation. Since my arrival in 2006, um, um, I was elected in September 2006 as uh, the chairman of the third committee, which deals with human rights, economic and social affairs. Then, um, September 2007, I was elected as vice president of the General Assembly. September uh, this year, I was elected as the president of the sixth committee. So, um, for three years, Iraq was in an in, uh, in uh, important position at the UN. Then we managed to terminate in Movic, a commission which was in charge of dismantling weapons of mass destruction. We managed to, to get a membership of Commission of Status of Women membership of Ecosoc Economic and Social Council, membership of Habitat, etc., etc. So we are in the process of uh, making Iraq back in position among international community, and we enjoy the support of uh, member states. We, for example, in the election for the Ecosoc, we managed to get 181 votes out of 192. My name is Randall Hall. Uh, with Rice University. I was wondering if you would uh, reflect a bit about the long-term prospects for proper cooperation between Iraq and Turkey on uh, issues of, uh, of the Kurd, the Kurdish uh, regions. Um, you know, there is a sensitive issue because of the Kurds in Turkey about um, the Kurds in Iraq. Um, but this, this issue has been um, easier recently. The Turks were, in the beginning, before the fall of the regime, and even after the fall of the regime, they were against federalism. And then when we kept telling them that this is an internal issue, now they accept federalism in Iraq. The red line for them is to have an independent Kurdish state. And the Kurds, the Kurdish leader, the Kurdish politician in Iraq, they realized that um, an independent state will be um, not feasible um, um, in Iraq now because if they have a Kurdish independent state, then Turkey will be against it, Syria will be against it, uh, Iran will be against it. Even if Iraq agrees, say, okay, you can have your independent state, they wouldn't have a, a sea to export their things or to import what they need. So it would be really difficult for them to live as an independent state. Now they, the political um, thinking of, of the Kurds has changed now. They feel they are part of Iraq. They don't want to, to be independent anymore. So the Turks now, um, they feel more comfortable with having a federal um, region or a Kurdistan regional government. And they start recently to have negotiation with the Kurdistan regional government if they're refusing for five years to talk to them directly. We have the problem of the PKK, uh, which attack Turkey from some Iraqi territories, but uh, it's Iraqi government decision and even Kurdish um, uh, government decision that Iraq shouldn't be uh, a base for attacks against Turkey and PKK shouldn't use Iraqi territories. The problem, they live in high mountains near the borders and we had so many meetings with the Turks try to uh, stop these attacks by the PKK against Turkey. Uh, my name is Tim Riley. Mr. Ambassador, uh, you told us a while ago that the uh, negotiation was ongoing with regard to a time withdrawal of the American forces and it was dependent on the, the establishment of a strong military uh, internal force within Iraq. I appreciate that it takes some time to build a strong military force and I know that Americans are responsible for the disbanding of the force that was there after uh, the invasion. But what I have, uh, uh, it sounds awfully open-ended that we want to have troops there as long as necessary. Uh, what size of standing army is Iraq looking at that would provide adequate security internally? And where are they now? And what kind of timetable, uh, at least in, in broad terms, are we looking at before that can be uh, accomplished? Okay. I'm sorry if um, I misunderstood when I say we need them as long as, um, or the troops should stay as long as they are needed. Actually. According to the SOFA draft, there, there is a timeline that American forces should with, be withdrawn from Iraq by the end of 2011. And by June 2009, they should be withdrawn from cities and towns to go to their bases. That's in the draft of uh, agreement which hasn't been signed yet. Now, whether this will be changed or not until we sign the agreement, I can't tell. But right now in the draft stated that by June 2009, 
2009, they will be withdrawn from streets and towns and cities to be in the bases only, but by the end of 2011, they should be withdrawn completely from Iran. However, in the draft, again, they say this timeline could be changed, could be earlier or later according to the situation on the ground. If the situation ground improve quicker, then they could be withdrawn quicker from Iraq. If the situation deteriorate, they could stay longer according to the requirement of the Iraqi government. So this is the timeline we have right now in the draft um, SOFA agreement. Uh, you have some questions Yes. I have a question. My name is Henrietta Alexander, and it's sort of uh, ancient history now. But um, the UN sent that guy, Scott, whatever his name was, right. to look for the weapons of mass destruction. Yeah, and he said that he couldn't find the weapons of mass destruction. And when we sent troops to Iraq, it was on the heels of that feeling that there were definitely weapons of mass destruction. That whole thing hurt our credibility from the UN um, and with our government, the, our government's credibility with the people here. Mm -hmm. That, you know, where are the weapons? Are there weapons? Mm -hmm. Why was that so convoluted? And why wasn't it more clear about the weapons of mass destruction? Okay. Um, we know that Saddam acquired, developed, and used weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. This is fact, it's being documented not by the Americans, but by the UN inspectors. More than that, we know that some quantities of these weapons, they were not accounted for. And Saddam regime keep claiming that he destroyed these weapons without the knowledge of the UN. The UN couldn't buy that story. And the whole world couldn't believe Saddam for the following reasons. From 1991, when the UN start inspection in Iraq about WMDs, until August 95, when his two sons-in-law defected to Jordan. Hussein Kamil, who was Saddam's son-in-law, he was in charge of this program to develop and acquire WMD. Now, when he defected to Jordan, he told the UN inspectors and the intelligence, Western intelligence, American, British, that the program in Iraq is much wider than they believe. More than that, he told them to go to certain places, including the beds of the river, to dig and to find weapons. And they went, and they found these weapons. So they discovered that between 91 and 95, Saddam was playing cat and mouse game with the UN inspectors. It's not US, nothing to do with the US. And you can go and check on those documents in the UN. Until today, the reports of inspectors saying that we have certain number of missiles, explosive, chemical weapons, biological weapons. We don't know what happened to them. We know Saddam produced this quantity of this weapon, and now they disappear. So they couldn't believe Saddam anymore. It's not a matter of the U.S. going there. This is one issue. What happened to these WMD? We don't know. Some people believe that Saddam destroyed them, but he started to bluff the West to deter them from attacking Saddam again by saying, I have them, I can use them. Some people believe that he, he, he managed to smuggle them, we don't know. But the fact that when the US forces went, they couldn't find them. But if Saddam was clean, and if Saddam was free of WMD, he could have left the sanction within three months after the Inmovic or INSCOM, which was before set up. Because if he could take them anywhere they like, you remember he was blocking them from going to certain places, he was hiding documents. So he was playing cat and mouse game. And the world believed that he had them and he hiding them because he want to use them. Now, the second issue is that um, I remember the US said they're going to go not only because of WMD, but because of violation of human rights. And we have so many examples where the international community interfere on that basis. In Kosovo, in Bosnia, in Haiti, there is a responsibility in the UN, in the international community, that when there is a dictator who kills his people, you know, who launch wars against neighboring countries, um, Saddam commit war crimes, genocide crimes against humanity, which is punishable by in the international law. So there is um, these issues. In, in, in addition to supporting terrorism, Saddam harbored these terrorist groups. They're still in Iraq. Some of them are still in Iraq. 
and they used to attack neighboring countries. They used to, to, you know, to kill and assassinate people. So on these bases, three bases, not only WMD, but I remember vividly that President Bush was talking in the UN before the invasion about uh, violation of human rights. So if we couldn't find WMD, that doesn't mean Saddam wasn't uh, oppressing his people or wasn't, you know, committed terrorist act. In actual fact, he tried to assassinate President uh, George Bush Sr. in Kuwait in 1994. This is international terrorism. He sent people um, to, to kill an American diplomat, or a, a Zarqawi, who was the, the leader of Al-Qaeda in Iraq in 2001. They killed Lawrence Foley, who was a high-ranking diplomat in Jordan. They went from Iraq. We don't believe somebody will go from Iraq all the way to Jordan to call a diplomat without the knowledge of, of the intelligence of Saddam region. And there are so many other stories I can tell about Saddam harboring and supporting terrorism. I'm Virginia Rorschach. I recently read that um, uh, there, that they did find, in 2003, that the Americans did find large quantities of uranium, and they took great precaution to, I think it was 23,000 acres, they uh, hid this in the desert or somewhere, I don't know, 20,000 acres, they protected it, our soldiers, with our soldiers and so on, they protected it because they were afraid uh, of the terrorists getting it. And I read that just recently, 2008, this was airlifted, this uranium, lots and lots and lots of uranium, was airlifted to Canada, first by boat and then uh, by air, to Canada to be used for nuclear energy. Is there any truth to that or not? Um, um, we had a reactor in Baghdad, which was bombed by the Israeli forces in 1982. Now, um, after the invasion, after the war of 2003, they discover um, some um, materials there. I'm not aware of desert and uranium in the desert. I'm not aware of that story, but I know for a fact that there was some contamination in the region, and this is very close to Baghdad, and that um, some of those materials where they were removed for safety of people because they were in that reactor um, before the bombardment uh, in, 18, in 1982. So there was some contamination because of the uranium and this um, experiment which uh, Saddam regime used to use. And by the way, Iraq now joined uh, the um, international treaties against proliferation of, of uh, nuclear weapons and even chemical weapons. And now it's part of our constitution that Iraq is not going to seek any kind of uh, weapons of mass action, whether they are nuclear, chemical, or biological weapons. It was my understanding that uh, the Bush administration kept this very quiet, even though it put uh, President Bush in a very bad light with the people and the world and so on because they thought that he had lied to them and so on. And um, so um, I, I don't know if there's... It would be difficult to believe that uh, if they discover any weapons, why they should hide them because in the first place they went to war because of that. I think if they discover any weapons, it would be good for them to say, we prove that we went to Iraq and there is this, these weapons in Iraq. This is my understanding. I don't think that would have been kept secret. Somebody in the back. Yeah. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes. Uh, I have a question. We uh, identify yourself, please. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, Renan Cooperman. Um, I have a question about uh, Iran. Uh, basically, you said that you're trying to maintain peaceful relations with Iran. And I'm sort of wondering, are you at all worried about the Iranian nuclear program? I mean, do you see it as a threat to Iraq or, or your have no worries as far as the intentions? No, we have worries. We have worries about excuse me, Iran nuclear program. In actual fact, at the UN, we always call, um, wh whenever we talk about disarmament, in the first committee, they deal with disarmament, and from time to time, I would deliver a speech about disarmament, and we always call for um, a, a, a Middle East, a free zone in the Middle East of uh, uh, weapons of mass destruction, especially nuclear. So when I said we want to live in peace, I mean we don't want to have a war against Iran because we are not in a position to have a war. We want to focus on reconstruction in Iraq. But that doesn't mean we will allow Iran to interfere in our internal uh, 
affairs, this one. Second, we don't want Iran uh, to be a danger for Iraq. If there is an attack against Iran, the first thing uh, Iranian will do, they will attack American troops in Iraq. So, and we will pay a heavy price. American and Iraqis will pay a heavy price for any war which is going to be erupted from the West and Iran. Iraq will pay a heavy price for that. So we don't want the war. Uh, we're not going to be in a position to fight Iranians. We want the Iranians to stop interference in our internal affairs. A nuclear issue, there are international um, mechanisms to uh, deal with that issue. But we think that um, we should, or the West should, um, give some incentives to Iran to encourage them to stop uh, uh, uranium enrichment. It, it happened in the past that th through negotiation they stop those kind of enrichment, and then the West really sh um, went away or they um, forget about Iran. They went back when they resume enrichment. I think there are still some kind of margin for negotiation to stop them from having uranium enrichment. Just one last question. Hi, my name is Yusuf Shamu. My father is, was from Iraq, so uh, welcome to the States again. Mm -hmm. uh, I was interested in following up on that question. Do you think that with the election of a, uh, a new American administration that Iraq could actually help facilitate uh, relations with Iran? I mean, you're the only partner that I think we're sort of jointly talking with all the time that has, a, has close personal interest in keeping good relations with Iran. Could you facilitate or help us maybe get through that tough Yes, we, we mediate between the two countries, and they have uh, two rounds of talks in Baghdad, uh, although it was only about Iraq, but it was useful for us. And part of the improvement of security in Iraq was because of those negotiations. So we would love to see the Americans sitting with the Iranians. Uh, and there was some improvement recently, uh, the meeting between the West and um, um, the Iranian the American uh, officials attending those, those meetings. So there's some progress, and we believe that there is always um, a, a space for negotiation. And um, uh, when I met James Baker in, in, uh, in New York, that was before uh, they issued the report, the Iraq uh, study group report, uh, I asked him about this issue. He said, we've been sitting with the Soviet Union for 40 years when their nuclear missiles were directed against our cities. He said, there's no problem with sitting with uh, countries you have problem with. And he said, I believe whenever there is a meeting, there's an agreement. So his view was really to, to go for negotiation with, with Iran. And I still believe there is no other way. You have a war against Iran, uh, it's going to be much more complicated. So giving them incentive to stop the enrichment. And recently there was some statement that they could stop enrichment if they guarantee they will have some kind of nuclear fuel from uh, abroad for the reactor and that um, they allow the IAEA to, um, of course, to search their facilities to make sure that's used only for civilian purpose. We can facilitate uh, this kind of meetings and we are trying our best and we are hoping for another round of negotiation in Baghdad to was postponed. We hope that would be resumed in the future. Thank you very much, Mr. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.